starting the coffee with chopsticks using the vortex method, the only true way to optimize the taste of your coffee at the molecular level. Good morning. Welcome to the Daybreak Show. I am the Sultan. We'll get started. But first, coffee in a Kansas Sunflower State coffee mug from a subscriber. <sighs> nice. Sumatra. Nice. Mm. Hot coffee on a cold morning. It is cold out there. How cold is it? It's colder than my ex-wife's heart. Now that's fucking cold. Fucking cunt. Well, on anti-aging, I've been doing red light therapy for the past month, twice a week. Skin, 100% clear. No blotchy, uneven color. No droopy, wrinkly skin. Biggest thing I've noticed is under here. Now, a lot of times women will kind of get wrinkles here. You see these women with their facelifts all, you know, their face is like all smooth. But the neck looks like a damn dryer vent hose. Men don't have that same issue. It seems like. I think women have less elasticity in their skin. But I will tell you, uh, for years of having a beard and stroking my beard, when I used to have the bigger beard, when you're yanking on your skin, be honest with you. When you're yanking on your skin, you're, or when you're yanking on your beard, you're really yanking on your skin. I remember when I shaved my beard off, I was like, what the hell happened? Because I was just like pulling on the skin all the time by stroking and just kind of like tugging on the beard, just sitting there doing stuff at your computer, you're watching TV or something, or just like whatever, and you're just kind of like yanking on the beard. That really wrecks the skin underneath. So I ended up with like really wrinkly skin. Do you see any wrinkles there now? Nothing, nothing. Red light therapy tightens everything up. The whole body too. I'm not kidding you. I mean, the body just kicked right back into shape. A seven minute session, twice a week. It feels like a healthy afternoon on the beach without the sunburn. Over 3,000 studies have been done on red light therapy. It fights skin aging, wrinkles, and you can look 10 years younger. Like I said, I'm not ready to take my shirt off yet. I'm not even sure if I'm going to do that. But I will tell you this, that the body is kicking into shape between working out, eating well, being very cognizant of my blood work. This guy, I'm closer to 60 than I am to 70. I got my pajama bottoms on right now, but... I mean, this this body is just kicking into shape. And it's not happening by accident. You lose fat. As a matter of fact, with red light therapy, you lose nearly twice as much as with diet and exercise alone. It rids your body of chronic inflammation. It fights the oxidative damage that drives aging. It increases strength, endurance, and muscle mass. I know that because it's all happening to me. Decrease pain, combat hair loss, build resilience to stress at the cellular level, speeds up wound and injury healing, combats autoimmune conditions, and improves hormonal health. I can attest to that. Optimizes brain function and mood. I can attest to that. Overcome fatigue and improve energy levels. There is zero downside to red light therapy. My gym that I go to in the like area of the gym where they have like tanning booths and uh, the hydro massage beds, they got a booth that you go in with red light therapy. At maximum nine minutes, I go in for seven minutes. And I'll tell you what, it is amazing. It is amazing. You'll notice a difference within two weeks. Find a gym that has red light therapy. Trust me on this one. Zero downside, nothing but upside, my friend, the acquaintance. The human body and mind is amazing and can last a lifetime if you are good to it. Now, I can't push and pull the weights that I used to, but I am still stronger than 99% 
of the male population. I'm closer to 60 than 70, but I'm still stronger than 99% of the male population. Your blood work is just as important as what you see in the mirror. You look in the mirror. That was one of my issues that I had a long time ago. Look in the mirror. It looked okay. I looked all right. Trim, you know, symmetrical, etc. Got the lab work done. Holy crap. Unbelievable. So keeping an eye only on the scale or mirror, you're falling short. That's only part of the picture. Start thinking about your blood work and having it optimized. And you do that through supplementation, proper eating, sleep, etc. Exercise. The golden ratio of 1.6 truly is a valid metric and a worthy goal. Your chest measurement should be 1.6 times larger than your waist measurement. If your waist measurement is bigger than the shoulder measurement, like you put a tape measure around this area here and a tape measure around your waist, this needs to be 1.6 times bigger, which shows, which is evidence of less visceral fat, which is the fat around your belly and the fat that surrounds your organs down around at that belly button level that what people call either like love handles or a spare tire around their waist. The 1.6. Again, I'll have to get up and show you real quick here. Let me just take this microphone off. area here, 1.6 times bigger than this area here. It's not just about aesthetics. It's about body mechanics, balance, gait, how you walk, your posture, how you stand, is your head above your body or is it moving forward because you know you're on the phone you're on the PC so we tend to move our heads a little forward move your head back a little bit sit up a little bit straighter now I'll show you something All right. this is typical computer behavior like this alright I'll do a little side view for you so typical computer behavior is like this see the head forward shoulders are rounded everything is like moving forward proper posture head up back shoulders back everything in line and stomach in that's why i preach to you on a regular basis stomach in chest out shoulders back head held high walk 25 percent faster just do that alone and your life will change. Joint and connective tissue health is definitely different as you age. As I am doing different exercises at the gym, I find that when I do, uh, for instance, the shoulder is a very complex joint. When I was younger, you kind of do something to your shoulder, you put ice on it, whatever. Stay out of the gym for a week, maybe you know, you're only doing like leg presses or that type of thing. Mess up your shoulder after 45. I'll even say after 40. And you could easily be out of the gym for a month or two. Easily. One of my mistakes was trying to bench a lot of weight when I started working out more diligently. And I felt it in my shoulders, not my chest. So I decreased the weight, kind of humbled myself. In my own head, I had to humble myself. And I'm using low weight, lo much lower weight than I used to. But my repetitions are super slow, and I keep the tension on. So when I'm bench pressing, it's literally like this.
1. Two, just incredible tension, super focus, very, very concentrated effort, as opposed to taking the weight off the rack. One, two, like I'm not doing that anymore. Not doing that. I'm doing. It's not, I'm not allowing the weight to come back to my chest fast. It's not like, I'm not doing that anymore. It's slow up like a five count up, a five count back. Insane. What it has done to my body is unbelievable. When I don't do that, I feel it here. I feel it here. There's also a tricep machine that I really like where you're sitting down at what looks like a preacher's bench, and you're holding these things, these handles, and you're going down like this. All right? I am loving that, loving it. I know when I, when I do kind of like these skull crusher things, you know, lay on the bench, and, and you have the dumbbell, and you're bringing it back like that, my elbows snap, they pop. Even when I do the kickbacks, pop, pop, but when I do that preacher bench thing, oof, oof, I get a great pump, elbows don't pop, and I don't feel anything in the shoulders. When I do the cable pull down, like not pull downs, the, uh, the tricep with a cable, okay, where you're just, you're holding that angled handle and you're pushing down like that, I feel the weight on that stack of weights almost like pulling on my shoulder joint and like almost like dislocating it. And it's just uncomfortable now. This new, for lack of a better term, preacher bench tricep extensions is unbelievable for me, for my joints. So, that being said, joint and connective tissue is a priority after 40. Now I'm a couple decades and a little bit more after 40 years old. And I think I should have taken that into consideration after 40 because I think a lot of the pain that I have now was from trying to put plates on the bar and max out and just always trying my personal best, always trying to like beat my own record. And I think what I did was I think I hurt myself permanently and it took a long time to come back from it. And I think that's why I kind of stopped working out or slowed down because it hurt. And I'm not talking about like, you know, embrace the suck and all that. I'm not talking about that kind of pain. Like yesterday I had it just a insanely great workout and I'm sore today but I'm not alarmed because this soreness is the result of working out not the result of an injury and there were so many times that I injured myself trying to do personal record deadlifts bench presses military presses I'm not doing that anymore at all at all you can mess up your joints mess up your soft tissue connective tissue ligaments and such. Continuing on the topic of aging, my mojo is strong, sex drive, the gorilla, as you heard me talk about, but it's manageable. It's such a beautiful thing and more easily channeled. A lot of guys don't talk about this. I don't know why. Like everything is either like we're all talking about, you know, in the men's community about getting laid and having sex and, you know, having the sex drive or it's nothing. What about that nice middle ground of, I got the mojo, it's there when I need it, it doesn't drive my life, it's no longer a motivator in my life. If I go out and about, it's not about who I can meet, who I can impress, it's, gee, there's a good band playing here, and I want to listen to some good music and have a nice bite to eat and have a good time, and leave at the end of the night and still go home and have a good night's sleep. 
I think maturity has a lot to do with that, too. I really do. My give a shit about the right stuff muscles are quite developed, and I don't want to say I've learned to not give a shit, because that sounds almost careless and cruel, and I'm still a very caring person with people who are needy and might need assistance, but I'm done giving a shit about the wrong people. Stop giving a shit about people that don't give a shit about you. Be one of the best decisions that you ever make. The mind starts going south when the body is neglected. Conversely, when the body is optimized, mental acuity is 100%. I got challenged by an amateur bodybuilder friend, Michael Butler. He's, he and I, are, I think, are the same age to a cutting contest starting in March, and I'm still thinking about that. Now, he is an amateur bodybuilder who trains seven days a week. I don't know if he's going to go IFBB Pro or not, but I saw a video of him doing 20 pull-ups unassisted. There's no way in the world I can do that. No way. Just can't do it. Right now, all of my pull-ups are assisted. My dips are assisted. And... <coughs> The cutting thing, maybe I'll do it. I don't know. What did I call that in the past? Um, shred. Getting shredded, right? Remember I called uh, October Shredtober and uh, February Shreduary. <laughs> but there is no downside to that either. Getting rid of the visceral fat and trimming down. That's not a bad thing. So I might take Michael up on that. I'm not sure yet. I, I, I do like the idea of throwing the gauntlet down and making a friendly wager, but he's, I think he's got the head start being the amateur bodybuilder, so I'm not sure if I'm going to go down that route. Uh, it can either strengthen me or scare me. I'm not sure. Or intimidate me. Not scare me, but intimidate me. I have no fear. I have zero fear in my life. And that's, that's a great thing. It can also be a bad thing. Recovery from everything in life is a little bit slower. Mentally, like you don't, you don't recover from mental setbacks as quick. You don't recover from physical injury as fast. So you learn to pace yourself a little bit more when you're a little bit older. You get to know who your real friends are, and guess what? They're not in the Manosphere. Manosphere. Manoswamp. The Dorcas Sphere. As a matter of fact, those who walked away from the Dorcas Sphere are better friends, mentally healthier, getting wealthier, becoming millionaires, multi-millionaires, and billionaires before my very eyes. Walking away from the manosphere is the true red pill experience. As soon as you make a thing out of the manosphere, when it went mainstream, started showing up, what did you end up getting? You know, when uh, on that Dr. Phil show, when they had a manosphere guy on there, and it was just like, oh no. I mean, I felt sorry for the guy. More power to him, but I felt sorry for the dude. And is it empowering spurgs and nerds and all that stuff? Yeah, I'm all for that. I'm all for anything that helps anyone who is uncomfortable and asocial. Not antisocial, but not very social. If it helps them come out of their shell, that's kind of cool. I like that. But you don't need the Manosphere to do that. Manosphere has like just become a weird... It's just a weird thing. It's almost becoming like a parody of itself from what I've seen. And like I said, everyone who has walked away from it is healthier and wealthier. Is there a connection? You decide. Someone being Christian or even a pastor does not mean they're going to be a friend, faithful, or work in your interest. The backstabbing and betrayal is stronger because you never expected it. Take that Christian or that pastor, put them in the manosphere, and it's like... Betrayal on steroids. I don't trust Christian guys in the manosphere. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
as far as the God pill is concerned, basically a Christian version of the red pill, much better, healthier, healthier. This is how you live life. You live life strong, and then you succumb to the rapid onset of age-related conditions. In other words, die of old age, not disease. You fall asleep with a smile on your face, like the Orthodox saints. What a great way to live. You know that Chinese proverb that says, dig your well before you're thirsty? Well, when you live in the Northeast, it's take your ibuprofen before you shovel. That actually has served me well. We haven't gotten a lot of snow here yet, but I'll tell you what, it's coming. I know it's coming. February is a wicked month up here. When we get that big old snowfall, and I get the shovel and the ice chopper out, in the past, I have found if I take a couple ibuprofen an hour before I shovel, I'm good. I am good. Without that, there's more injury. I don't know if there's any science behind that, but... It certainly works for me. I dumped iron yesterday for the first time in 40 years. Overall, good experience. In other words, I gave blood at a blood, uh, a Red Cross blood donation event. Good experience. I feel good. I'm deciding now if I should do it four times a year or six times a year. So I gave a pint of blood yesterday as a result of reading dumping iron, not pumping iron, dumping iron, because iron causes a lot of autoimmune issues. Uh, excessive iron can cause cancer. Excessive iron can cause cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. So reducing the iron amount, because iron rarely, if ever, leaves your body. Do your homework on that. So dumping iron can actually be good for you. Actually a good thing. Next week I get lab work done. So we'll see what happens with my blood count and all that stuff. But everyone who does bloodletting actually is healthier. There's something to it. There's something to bloodletting. Can't put my finger on it. I don't know the science behind it. But the book Dumping Iron talks about it by P.D. Mangan, who you've seen on this channel before. I love this line by Rollo Tomasi. You cannot negotiate genuine desire. The idea that you can rationally barter for someone's real desire is the biggest lie ever sold by modern psychotherapy. In fact, negotiating desire has the opposite effect on desire. It only promotes obligated compliance and resentment. That was written 10 years ago by Rolla Tomasi in the book The Rational Male. What do I have here? Oh, this is uh, Rational Male Religion. But the first book, invaluable, invaluable. Just get it. I'll put a link for it down below. Get the book, read it. If you don't want to read it, listen to it. Get the audio book. There's no downside. It was once said that adversity reveals genius. Prosperity conceals it. Nowadays, people think that they can think or visualize or raise their vibrations to prosper. Uh, what? Really? Okay, Beavis. That's not happening. I can't wish and hope that a roast beef sandwich becomes a ham sandwich. I can't sit with no sandwich in front of me and think, ham sandwich, ham sandwich, and all of a sudden the ham sandwich appears. Ain't gonna happen. You have to do something about it. So, look at your W-2 and your 1099s. What an appropriate time of year to do that. How's all that visualization working for you? It's called goal setting and taking action. It's not the law of attraction. It's the law of action that helps you prosper. You can think healthy body, healthy body, healthy body, jacked body. Unless you get your ass to the gym, you're going to be taking insulin and getting cancer and having cognitive decline and forgetting where you put your damn keys and not, be able, not being able to get an erection and not sleeping well. You gotta act on everything. Put down Deepak Chopra and pick up Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie. Napoleon Hill, he was okay with the think and grow rich, but it started this mass delusion that you could think your way to success. 
Napoleon Hill interviewed men who didn't think their way to anything if you study him. He met and studied people like F.W. Woolworth, Charles Schwab, Thomas Edison, John Wanamaker, Harvey Firestone, Alexander Graham Bell. You recognize those names? All men who invented, tested, created, and worked their asses off and didn't have time to think and visualize and raise their vibrations. The minute anyone talks about raising your vibrations, the first, I just, all right, the minute anyone talks about high vibration, low vibration, the first thing that you should be thinking in, the, in your head is <whistles> cuckoo bird, cuckoo bird, pure nuts. Men's coaches out there, oh crap. Raise your vibration, shut up, shut up. How about raising a barbell? How's that? How about getting your ass out of bed? Jesus rose from the dead, you can't even get out of bed. Dale Carnegie believed it starts in the head, but it must end with massive action. It's Dale, not Deepak, my friendly acquaintance. The widower, talked about widowers in the past. The widower, widower is a hidden demographic. You don't know the widower. You walk around, you're on the city streets, you're in a mall, you're in a store. You don't know who the widower is, not like, and you don't even know who the widows are, but they walk amongst us silently sad, confused and in pain. A man coping with the death of his wife and figuring out what should I do now and how do I do it is very unique. It's different than the widow. There's 300 page books on being a widow. The widower gets a 20 page booklet. Society doesn't know what to do with a widower, and I'll say this, just like the newly divorced or separated guy who is still in shock, get the widower out of his house. Have him meet you for coffee. I'm gonna pick you up at nine. Be ready. Click. Don't even give him a chance to respond. I'll pick you up at nine. Go out for breakfast. Get him out to do a five mile walk. Go see a band. Invite him to go work out. Have him assist you in building something together. Simple things like this will make a difference in a man's life as he is vulnerable and tempted to isolate as a new widower. Don't give advice. Get him out of the house. Get him moving. If he wants therapy, he'll ask for it. If he needs counseling, he'll ask for it. If he needs coaching, he'll ask for it. Get the widower out of the house. That's super important. Part-time jobs are a great low commitment way of exploring your options for careers, whether it be sales, retail, trades, or independent contractor work. You might ask, should I do this or that? My answer is, try it. Try it. You might enjoy it. You might get good at it. You might cash in, but at least try it. Don't eliminate it until you try it. the world's largest home church for men, here, is at it again. One subscriber says, my partner, who only a week ago told me she loved me more than anything, broke up with me last night over a text and refuses to see me face to face to discuss it. Didn't even put up a fight for the relationship. I was watching your videos hoping I'd be the lucky one who didn't experience the betrayal, betrayal of an evil, heartless woman, but here I am. Your videos are important. You seem to talk nothing but the truth and lessons. I respect you, sir, for what you do and will keep coming back. Praying for you and your channel. What will be will be what gets me through this heartbreak. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. The world's largest home church for men. I say that kind of jokingly. I had a friend, years as a associate pastor, minister of music in a Baptist church, I'm not going to say his name, or even the denomination, the particular Baptist denomination, pianist, composed original music, cantatas, plays, brilliant composer. The pastor, a little bit older than him, retires, and then who takes over the church? The pastor's son. They hire a church growth consultant that I know 
and w would completely condemn if I wasn't afraid of a lawsuit. And they said, get rid of the old guy on the piano. Ditch the hymnals, the organ. Get rid of the piano. Get a handsome, young, hip worship leader with an untucked shirt that plays guitar and can start a contemporary worship band. Have a spotlight in the back uh, shining on the stage. Get rid of the altar. Have colored lights on the stage. And lower the lights in the church area. Brighten the lights on the stage. And they unloaded my buddy, who was a pastor in that church for over 30 years. I wonder how that church is doing now. That was the beginning of me returning to my liturgical roots. I actually have contempt and hate for modern churches, non-denominational churches that look like a concert, that lower the lights, that have some egotistical, hip dude with an untucked shirt playing guitar in a breathy voice saying the same lyrics over and over a thousand times. I have such contempt for modern worship. I can't even begin to tell you. Can't even begin to tell you. And I used to be a worship leader in a church. I walked away from it. I love the people, I love the church, but I had to walk away from modern worship. I can't do it. Can't do it anymore. Did you ever shed a tear at the death of someone that you personally never knew? Two people did that for me. Keith Green and Rich Mullins. Don't know why. Their music really touched me over the years. I would if I was you, I would get a complete works of Keith Green and a complete works of Rich Mullins. I could listen to them for the rest of my life and nothing else. Now, decades ago, when I was in my 20s, I remember I met Phil Keggy at an airport. He was puffing on a pipe in an airport pub back when you could smoke a pipe indoors. And we chatted for over an hour. I doubt he even remembers this, because it happened maybe in like 86, something like that. One of the things I asked him was, how was Keith Green in real life? Phil said he was exactly like you would imagine. Personable, a gentleman, funny, caring, and a true heart for people. It wasn't an act. So Keith Green... Thank you very much for your contribution to my life. And with that, finish your coffee, and I'll see you on the next Daybreak Show, your home of sanity, clarity, and reason.